Acts chapter 13. Taking up in Acts 13, where we left off the last time we were here together. And we'll read verses 13 through 41. It's a rather lengthy portion of text, but it's my purpose to work through this together with you today. Remind you that this is God's inspired and an errant word, and that it deserves every bit of our careful attention. Acts 13, beginning at verse 13. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch, And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. And after reading the law, uh, the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. And Paul stood up, and motioning with his hand, he said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in Egypt. With an uplifted arm, he led them out from it. And for a period of about 450 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. And after these things, he gave them judges until Samuel, the prophet. And then they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And after he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. From the offspring of this man, according to the promise, God has brought us to Israel a Savior, Jesus. And after John had proclaimed before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and while John was completing his course, he kept saying, What do you suppose that I, suppose that I am? I am not he. But behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brethren, sons of Abraham's family and those among you who fear God, to us the word of this salvation is sent out. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him nor the utterances of the prophet, which are read every Sabbath, fulfill these by condemning him. And though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate, that he be executed. And when he, they had carried out all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him up from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to, to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers that God fulfilled this promise to our children in that he raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second psalm you are my son today I have begotten you and as for the fact that he raised him from the dead no more to return to decay he has spoken in this way I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David therefore he also says in another psalm you will not abandon You will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among the fathers and underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through uh, through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed, and through him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified through the law of Moses. 
Take heed, therefore, so that the thing spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. Behold, you scoffers, and marvel, and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Our gracious and most glorious God, we look to you and to your word. We thank you for the revelation that you have given us. We pray that you'd be pleased now to make yourself known to your people, to, to instruct us, to help us by the power of the Spirit of Christ himself. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When a professor assumes the chair of a department in a seminary, he delivers an inaugural lecture or an inaugural sermon. By that point, that professor has already lectured in the classroom many times, and typically he's already addressed the whole body of the seminary. But then once he takes up the chair, once he moves from what's typically called an associate professorship in a, in a seminary to a chair to a permanent place as a professor in a seminary, he delivers an inaugural speech, an inaugural lecture, an inaugural sermon. Now we can think of what, what we have in our text as the Apostle Paul's inaugural missionary sermon. Paul has preached before already, since his conversion. In fact, he began to preach almost immediately. It's uh, remarkable to think about the way Paul, uh, immediately there in, the, in the, the synagogues of Damascus, began to preach the word of God concerning Christ. That's what we're told there in Acts chapter 9 after Paul's conversion. Perhaps it's not so remarkable because we know that Paul was equipped to do so. He was steeped in the Old Testament scriptures. And once he was equipped with the Holy Spirit, he was immediately equipped to preach the word of God. We know also from chapters 12 and 13 that Paul has been preaching in a different Antioch than the one that we have in our text, Antioch of Syria. But he was there with Barnabas, and the Barnabas were preaching and teaching God's word. Paul was one of the prophets and teachers at Antioch, Syria. Chapter 13 and verse 1 tells us. But here we have the first sample of Paul's preaching in the synagogues of the Jews, in this, his first missionary campaign. And in our text, the Holy Spirit reveals to us what biblical preaching is. This is of great importance, because a lot of people have a lot of ideas about what preaching is to be. But our preaching is not according to the ideas of individuals, what they've experienced in their lifetimes as Christians in churches. Preaching is defined, no surprise, by the Bible. So here we have a sample, and it's actually probably one of the most remarkable samples of biblical preaching in the entire corpus of Scripture. And that's what we're going to consider primarily today. We're going to consider two things. In the first place, we will look at 
The occasion of Paul's inaugural sermon, as we're calling it, in this first missionary campaign, and then we'll look at the substance of that sermon. The occasion and the substance of Paul's inaugural missionary sermon. In other words, we're going to look, uh, we're going to pick up where we left off. Uh, we're, we want to trace what Paul is doing in this first missionary campaign. Uh, where he's gone, he's been on the island of Cyprus. Now they've moved on to a different location on the shores of Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. <clears throat> and then we're going to look, uh, spend most of our time looking at the sermon that Paul preached, of, of what that sermon consists, how Paul lays out the word of God in this Jewish synagogue. So in the first place, the occasion of Paul's inaugural missionary sermon. Paul sailed from Cyprus to the coast of Asia Minor. And one of the things that's most interesting about this account of, of Paul's next movement in this first missionary campaign is Paul's emerging leadership. You notice the way we're told that Paul and his companions put out to sea. So Paul is the emergent leader now of, of uh, the, the mission excursion, this first missionary campaign. Paul is in the driver's seat, so to speak. Paul and his companions now are ministering the gospel. Perga, in the region of Pamphylia, is their first destination. And the significance of this first stopping point on the shores of Asia Minor is not gospel ministry. It doesn't find its, its significant at this point in Paul's ministry there because Luke doesn't tell us that he preached in Perga. So if he did, I suppose it's possible, but we don't know anything about it. Its significance, the significance of this first stopping point is that John left them. John Mark, the one that he and Barnabas had agreed uh, would take, they would take him along on this first missionary campaign. He left them, he returned to Jerusalem. Now we don't know why. Many have speculated about why he, he left them. We don't, we don't know. And left is, is really a neutral word. But what Paul will say later when he and Barnabas have a disagreement over whether to continue or to, or to bring Mark back onto the mission team, so to speak, is, is quite significant. We find that in chapter 15, in verses 37 to 40. Paul, some days, after some days, this is just prior to their second missionary campaign, Paul said to Barnabas, let's return and visit the brethren in every city that we proclaim the word, in which we proclaim the word, see how they are. And Paul and Barnabas was desirous of taking John, and John called Mark. So this is John Mark, the John Mark that we know. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him, who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. So, even though we don't know why John left them, Paul speaks of it in pretty strong terms here. And I think this is a good translation of this word. Your, your version may have something like departed, whatever the case might be. But I think, I think deserted, based on what I have found in the study of the original language, I think this is a good translation. I think John Mark deserted Paul and Barnabas. I think he's culpable for what he did there in Perga of Pamphylia. But what's significant about the significance of John Mark in Acts chapter 13 and verse 13 is not his desertion. Because later in Paul's life, 
Paul will say to Timothy, come as soon as you can. Paul's in prison, remember, at the end of his life. He says to Timothy, come as soon as you can. It was winter. He said, bring my parchments. No surprise. Bring, bring my books, he said. Bring a cloak. And bring John Mark. It's a great balm to the souls of any who in any sense have been unfaithful to the Lord in the church. It's water to the soul. Because we know that God has the power to take one who was a deserter of the gospel in Pamphylia and to restore him and to make him useful in the kingdom. What a wondrous thing we discover about this man named John Mark who left Paul and Barnabas before they likely before they ever really did anything on this first missionary campaign. Well, from there, they proceeded inland across the Taurus Mountains. If you look at the geography of Asia Minor, if you look at where they're going inland from Perga uh, to their next destination, there's a mountain range that they have to cross to get there. Who knows? Maybe, maybe that's one of the reasons Mark was hesitant to go, to go with them. We, we certainly don't know. But they're going toward Pisidian Antioch. Uh, that was one of 16 cities named Antioch in the ancient world. And so ancient writers distinguish these uh, 16 different cities by referring to the region in which uh, these uh, cities were, and this was Pisidian, not Syria, but Pisidian Antioch. Why did they choose Pisidian Antioch? Luke doesn't tell us. Why, why Antioch more than the accessible cities of the coast? We don't know. The extended family of Sergius Paulus, that proconsul to which Paul had preached in Cyprus, we know from extra-biblical history, lived in Pisidian Antioch, and maybe, maybe Sergius Paulus gave them a recommendation to, to the people there. We, we just don't know. What we do know is that Pisidian Antioch was one of the most important cities of Asia Minor in this Roman province of Galatia, had a large Jewish population. And because of the, the city's Jewish population, Paul and Barnabas were able to find a synagogue. So the first Sabbath that came along, they went to the, they went to the synagogue and they, they sat down. Now, synagogue worship was similar to the worship that we have in our Protestant churches today. It was simple worship. In the synagogues, all of the ceremonial trappings of the temple were cast aside, and there was, uh, the focus was simply the prayer and the reading of the law and the prophets and the explanation of the law and the prophets. And on this particular occasion, the reading of the law and the prophets was followed by an invitation to Paul and Barnabas to give an explanation, to, to say a word of explanation to the people. Verse 15 tells us, and although the invitation was extended to both of them, Paul, the, the leader of this missionary expedition, took up, took up the charge and, and preached to the people there in the synagogue. Now, that's consistent with what Paul's done so far. That's what he did in Cyprus. He went to the synagogue. It's the very first place they went. That's what he will do throughout his ministry, and it's consistent, remember, with the directive that Paul had received. The gospel is to go to the Jew first. And also to the Greek. The gospel is to go to the Jew first and also to 
the Gentile. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Paul said. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So much then for, for, the, for the occasion of this inaugural missionary sermon. We'll spend the rest of our time now on the substance of this sermon. It's a remarkable sermon. I want you to notice the structure of the sermon. I think this is probably the only three-point sermon we have in the Bible. You notice the three sections here, each introduced by words of address to the hearers. Men of Israel and you who fear God, verse 16. And what follows, verse 16, is the first point. And then brethren, sons of Abraham, uh, Abraham's family, those among you who fear God, verse 26. That's his second point. Therefore, let it be known, brethren, verse 38. That's his third point. You notice that Paul addresses two groups of hearers here. He addresses the Jews. He addresses the men of Israel. And then he addresses the God-fearers. Uh, the God-fearers are those who, like, are, are, who are like uh, Cornelius, the centurion, who, Paul had, who Peter had met, the one who called Peter. God said to, to Cornelius, send for a man named Peter, ask him to come to you, preach the word of grace to you. And so Peter did. Cornelius was a God-fearer. Is one that was associated with the synagogue, but not one who was yet a proselyte. So he was, would not have been a man who was circumcised, for example. He'd not, he'd not done everything that the Jewish law would have required of him. Section 1 in verses 16 to 25 surveys God's work among his people Israel from the Exodus to John the Baptist. So all that God did from the Exodus to John the Baptist with a focus on David. That's important. Section 2, the second point of the sermon, verses 30, 26 to 37, narrates Jesus' sufferings and resurrection, showing that they fulfilled the promised blessings to David. Section 3, the third point, 38 to 41, draws the application. Promises forgiveness to all who believes and warns unbelievers to flee from the wrath to come. So we'll look at these three points. First, in 16 to 26, Paul preached God's grace in Israel's history. And God's grace began with choosing Israel. We, we read about that this morning, didn't we, in Deuteronomy chapter 7. God's choice of Israel, not based in anything uh, Moses emphasized uh, in Israel, not their prominence, not their worthiness, but on God's love and faithfulness. And we could easily uh, see that elsewhere, it, especially in the book of Deuteronomy, to which Paul is very likely alluding here. So God's grace to Israel began with his choosing them. His loving kindness was further shown in the way he made Israel great. Verse 17 says. Now that's very interesting, isn't it? He literally exalted Israel in Egypt. How could God have exalted Israel if they were slaves in Israel? Well, he did so by multiplying them numerically. He made Israel a great nation in the land of Egypt, even as he had promised to their forefather, Abraham. <clears throat> even more clearly, God showed his grace to Israel by leading them out of Egypt with an uplifted arm. Remember how many times uh, the book of Deuteronomy, for example, speaks of God's outstretched arm, the way that God led Israel out of Egypt. God's grace was further evident in his dealings with Israel during their 40 years in the wilderness. Now, your translation reads something like mine that he put up with them in the wilderness. 
You might know that there are many copies of the Greek New Testament and that they don't all agree. And one of the interesting things about this particular verse in the, the uh, Greek manuscripts is that the spelling of this key verb, which in your translation and mine has something like put up with, varies in the Greek manuscripts, and the change of a single letter in the word makes the difference between put up with them or carried them in the wilderness. Carried them gently in the wilderness. Now, both of these are true with regard to Israel, aren't they? God put up with them in the wilderness. They sinned against him. They grumbled against him greatly in the wilderness. But he also carried them. One of the remarkable evidences of of, of this is this particular word, which may be the very word that appears here, for all we know, in Acts chapter 13. And in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you just as a man carries his son. And all the way which you have walked until you came to this place. I think God's focus, the Spirit's focus here in our text makes it likely. That what Paul is saying to Israel is that he carried you. As a man carries his son. And what's true of Israel in the wilderness is true of you and it's true of me. God puts up with us. He puts up with our sin. He puts up with our disputing. He puts up with our grumbling. but he's compassionate. And when we fall, he cares us. You remember how when your children were young and you were on a long walk wherever it was and they became tired and they began to cry. You picked them up and you carried them. Dear Christians, that's what God does for his people. He carries us. He shows compassion to those whose sin he has to put up with. Because he loves us and he's chosen us to be his own people. In fact, everything that could be said of Israel here can be said of you and me as those who've been redeemed by Christ. Is that true? Hasn't God shown great mercy in choosing us? Hasn't he shown his great love to us by choosing us of all the peoples of the earth? Hasn't God multiplied us even in our difficult circumstances? Hasn't God been good to us in our, in, during the times of our lives when we've struggled? Hasn't he brought us out of the Egypt of our sin and delivered us? And carried us and put up with us because God loves us as his people. Paul moves on in verse 19 to remind his hearers in the synagogue that God also dispossessed all these nations, all seven nations. We read about that again, Deuteronomy chapter 7 this morning in the reading of the law. A process that took 450 years. God, God's gracious gifts to Israel, verse 20, included Samuel and the judges. The judges until Samuel, at which time they asked for a king, verse 21. God first gave them Saul, and after he had removed Saul, he raised up David, verse 22. Did you notice that, God, that, that Paul passes over Israel's obstinance toward him 
during the period of the judges, during the period of, of Samuel. Did you notice that, that Paul passes over God's disagreement with Israel over their desire for, the, for a king like all the nations around them? He merely says that he removed Saul. He doesn't focus on, on why it was that Saul was removed, why the, the fact that Saul was unfaithful to God, that he, uh, he really never knew the Lord. It's because the focus here in Paul is a focus of grace. God gave them David, a man after God's own heart. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. And that gives Paul opportunity to speak of Jesus, the greater son of David. Descent from David is an essential qualification for the Messiah. read about the promise of the Messiah, who's a descendant of David in the Old Covenant Scriptures. We read about, uh, in, we read in the Gospels, in Matthew and Luke, the importance of descent from King David. These are the promises that are being realized through the line of Judah, through King David. And Paul is honing in here on those promises that God gave to David, the blessings that would be fulfilled in David, and it's that fulfillment that he'll go on to, to speak about. Before God sent a Savior, he sent John. He sent John the Baptist. He sent him to preach a, a, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Verse 24. He was not the Messiah. Remember how clear John made that? We have John's interchange with the priests and the Levites who came out to speak to him. John chapter 1 said, I'm not he. And what he said, in fact was I'm not even worthy to do a slave's task. I'm not worthy to untie the sandals, to take the sandals off the feet of the Messiah. He's to come. So Paul preached grace in Israel's history. That's what he did first. That's his first point. God's grace to Israel. That's what we could entitle this first point. But the second point of Paul's sermon unfolds the person and work of the Savior whom God had promised to his people Israel. What did Jesus do to secure the salvation of his people? Well, Paul preaches two things here. He preaches the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Verses 27 to 37. But what does Paul say about the death of Jesus in verses 27 to 29? He stresses the points that Peter emphasized in his sermons. A sermon on, uh, on the day of Pentecost. A sermon on, uh, at the temple, at the gate called Beautiful. If we wanted, we could go back. We could see the, the, the vast parallels between what Peter preached and what Paul preached. But first, in verse 27... He stresses that the Jews, those who live in Jerusalem, verse 27 says, and their rulers were ignorant of Jesus and of the prophetic scriptures that speak of him. That's precisely the way Paul described himself in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 13, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, and yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. So Israel is culpable for their sin. They're ignorant, but their sin is forgivable. That's the message that Paul is trying to get across here. He shows that the Jews both unjustly condemned Jesus and handed him over to Pilate, verse 28. Third, verse 29, that Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures in, in this regard. That, that the Jews and the rulers of Israel carried all, out all 
that was written concerning Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit stresses through the biblical pens of the writers of Scripture, that everything that took place, everything that happened to Jesus, all that God did was a fulfillment of what he had spoken through the Old Testament scriptures. What the Jews did, they did so culpably, they were guilty, but they did according to the sovereign plan of a sovereign God who determined to save a people whom he had sovereignly elected. What does he say about the resurrection in verses 30 to 37? Men condemned and crucified Jesus, but God raised him up. In doing so, God did not allow the verdict of ignorant humans against Jesus to stand. The resurrection is God's vindication of his only begotten son. Furthermore, verse 31, Paul stresses that there there were many witnesses to the resurrection. Jesus made multiple resurrection appearances for many days to those who came up with him from Galilee. And these are the very men who have been proclaiming the gospel in their midst. In the midst of God's people, Israel. Additionally, verse 32 to 37, Jesus' resurrection also fulfilled the scriptures. Verses 32 and 33, the good news that Paul was preaching was the promise made to the fathers, which God had fulfilled to us, the children. And Paul demonstrates this claim that the resurrection fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures by reference to three particular passages. First, Psalm 2, 7, verse 33. It's very interesting, isn't it? Psalm 2, 7. The psalmist writes, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Paul says that's, that the, the resurrection is a fulfillment of Psalm 2-7. It's a fulfillment that God raised up Jesus. How so? Not that Jesus' sonship had his beginning at, the, at his resurrection, but rather Paul, the apostle, the inspired writer of Scripture, inspired interpreter of Scripture, understood Psalm 2-7 to mean that the eternal son entered a new phase of his sonship in the resurrection. Not only fulfilling the promises of Scripture, but securing for his people all that they need for their salvation. It's remarkable how central the resurrection of Jesus Christ is to the book of Acts. It's not something that's a focal point only on Easter Sunday. But it's a focal point throughout the pages of Scripture, whether it's the Old Testament Scriptures that predict the resurrection of Christ or the New Testament Scriptures that reveal to us how that resurrection took place and the witnesses that God raised up for that resurrection. The second and third passages that Paul quotes are from Isaiah 55, 3. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David, recorded in verse 34. And then Psalm 16, 10. You will not allow your holy one to undergo decay, recorded in verse 35. Now remember, that's a very passage to which Peter pointed in his Pentecost sermon. How do these third, uh, second and third passages support Paul's point. Well, negatively, the scripture promised that unlike David, Jesus, God's Holy One, would not undergo decay. The promise, in other words, the promise of Psalm 1610, you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay, even as Peter pointed out in that Pentecost sermon, didn't apply to David because David was in the grave and he was decaying. It applied to Jesus whom God did not allow to undergo decay, but raised him up on the third day. Positively, God granted to Jesus at his resurrection 
the holy and sure blessings of David. Those holy blessings refer to the salvation that Christ has accomplished by his obedience, by his death, by his resurrection. They're sure blessings precisely because Jesus has been raised from the dead, never to die again, existing now in his resurrected body in heaven, fully God, fully man. And the Father hasn't given these holy and sure blessings to his risen and exalted Son alone. This word translated you in Isaiah 55, 3, in that quote, that I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David, is in the plural. Those blessings, those holy and sure blessings, were procured through the resurrection of Christ for you, and for me. And it's the power of that resurrection that not only underlays, not only, is not only the foundation, not only the power for our entire Christian experience, but it's the basis upon which we ourselves will be raised from the dead, isn't it? So Paul preached God's grace in Israel. He preached salvation in the death and resurrection of Christ. And in the third point, he proceeds to press the claims of Christ upon his hearers. Christ's accomplishments, Christ's saving work on behalf of his people. Paul preached in verses 38 to 43 the absolute necessity of faith in Jesus Christ. And in these final verses of our text, Paul gives an invitation and he gives a warning. The invitation of verses 38 and 39 is an offer of forgiveness of sins and justification. I have no idea why my translation has freed here in verse 39. Through him, everyone who believes is free. It's the word justified. Through him, everyone who believes is justified from all things, from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Now, that's what justification is, isn't it? It's the pardon of all our sins. It's being accepted and accounted righteous because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is putting forth here. He's putting forth to of the Jews and the God-fearers that he's addressing that day in the synagogue, uh, the very thing that he highlights elsewhere in the Scriptures. For example, in Galatians chapter 2, it's very clear. He says, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Chapter 2 and verse 15. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified... By the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we may, be, we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. Now it's abundantly clear, is it not? And Paul makes it clear here in his sermon uh, to these Jews and, and God fears that the law of Moses couldn't do this. He says, and notice twice, it's through him. Verse, 30, verse 38, it's through him, that is through Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him, that is through Jesus, everyone who believes is justified. The law of Moses can't do it. Law works can't do it. And Paul makes it clear in the passage in Galatians from which we read, has he not? That it's not only through Jesus, it's through the instrument of faith in Jesus. It's by faith alone in Jesus. And then he follows that invitation with the warning that we find in verses 40 and 41 of our texts. Just as the prophets had spoken of a Savior to come 
So they warned God's covenant people of the consequences of refusing that Savior. And the citation here in verse 41 is from Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 5. It was spoken to Judah. It was a prophecy to Judah concerning the imminent Babylon invasion and captivity. God was warning His covenant people not to respond to Him in unbelief. And so Paul's warning His hearers not to respond to the preaching of Christ in unbelief. There's been an invitation issue. It's an invitation to, to receive full forgiveness of sins and justification through faith in Jesus. But this notice that this what's being warned of here has not yet taken place. Verse 40, take heed therefore so that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. Habakkuk was crying out to the people. He was warning them of the impending Babylonian captivity if Israel did not repent from their sins. And the judgment that's being spoken of here has not yet taken place. But it will. And so God is, through Paul, issuing this warning to every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. The only way to escape this judgment is to look to Jesus in faith. So the question for every man and woman and boy and girl is, will you obstinately refuse to believe the gracious offer of the gospel in Jesus Christ? Would you forego all of the pleasures of heaven itself? All the pleasures of eternity, all the pleasures of communion with God, would you trade that for destruction under God's judgment in hell forever? Paul is pleading with these Jews and God fears. I plead with any in the hearing. If you're refusing to believe in Jesus, turn from your ignorance the ignorance that keeps you, the ignorance that's blinded you, the ignorance that has stopped up your ears, and look to Jesus and believe in Him alone for salvation. Well, I think two things are uh, practically, two, two things come forth practically here. First of all, we should know what biblical preaching is. We should know. We mustn't try to determine what preaching is based on our experience in the church, the way this preacher or that preacher has preached in a former congregation where you had your membership. The Bible defines preaching. Tradition in churches does not define preaching. The Bible defines it. It, it must dictate our view of preaching. And biblical preaching does three things, essentially. We glean this from Paul's preaching. Biblical preaching explains the Bible. That's essentially what Paul does. He's explaining the Bible to these Jews and God-fearers. Now, what's interesting is that these Jews and God-fearers knew the Bible. And they knew the things that Paul was speaking to them. And yet he reminded them, didn't he? He said, this is what God has done for Israel. This is the grace. These are the gifts that God has given to Israel over all these years. The preacher can't explain the Bible without referring to the Bible. So you shouldn't be surprised when, when I take you to the text and explain the Bible. And refer you, refer you to what the Bible says. I can't see how that could possibly 
surprise you if that's, if that's what preaching is to be, an explanation of the Bible. Secondly, biblical preaching proclaims Christ. And one of the things that our text surely teaches us is that Christ is in all the scriptures. So the goal of the preacher is to preach Christ from all the scriptures. That's what every biblical preacher does. It's what he seeks to do. Does he do so perfectly? Not at all. It's a formidable task. But that's, that's the goal. That's the pattern. Explaining the Bible, preaching Christ from the Bible, whatever passage it might be, and then applying the Bible. Now, there's an idea in Reformed churches today. There's a certain model of preaching that says we shouldn't apply the Bible, that the Holy Spirit is the one who applies the Bible, and that the preacher's job is to preach Christ, which it is, but then having preached Christ, his job is to let the Holy Spirit do his job. But that's not what... that's. Frankly, it's nonsense. Just so you know what I think about it. Because Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, it's a very serious exhortation to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season and listen. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Now that says something, doesn't it? It says something to those who have the idea that they should always walk away from a sermon feeling good about themselves or who don't think that the claims of scriptures, that sin should be addressed in the lives of the members of the congregation, it shouldn't be any surprise if you know yourself and you're honest with yourself. And I know that you're sinful people because I'm a sinful man. You shouldn't be surprised when, when I address your sin from the pulpit. It shouldn't, you shouldn't be surprised when I say some strong things about your lives and your sin from the pulpit. Because Paul says to Timothy, reprove, rebuke, exhort. Those are strong things. And the preacher's job is not to capitulate to uh, the, the desires or the whims of the people of God under the hearing of the word, his job is to be a biblical preacher and to do what's according to the model that God has given us in the Bible. Paul will go on to speak about a time that will come when they'll not endure sound doctrine but wanting to have their ears tickled. They'll accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But he says, you, Timothy, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And doing the work of an evangelist, which is subsumed in the office of every preacher, is to preach Christ, to explain the Bible, to preach Christ from the Bible, and to apply the Bible. God shows us. We don't have to guess what biblical preaching is. It's very clear from the examples we have in Scripture. And we should know that. And we shouldn't buckle under biblical preaching. 
must know what biblical preaching is. And then let me say one final time that you should heed the warning. Listen to the invitation. Come to Christ. Come to faith in him. Listen to the warning. Don't consign yourself by your obstinance and your refusal to look to Christ. Don't consign yourself to eternal judgment in hell. Jesus, that's who Paul preached. Jesus, he's the one who's been set before you today. He's our all. His death, his resurrection has accomplished it all. There's nothing left. There's no further satisfaction. His satisfaction, his obedience, it's our all. And so God says, put the fullness of your trust. Devote the fullness of your faith in the living, exalted Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we do bless your great and glorious name for the gracious work that you've done in your people throughout their history. Israel, how you chose them and delivered them out of Egypt and brought them into their inheritance in the promised land and sustained them through the period of the judges and the kings and the way, O Lord, that you've sustained your church even down to the present age and the way you've put up with us and carried us through the wilderness. We bless your great and glorious name. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you, O Lord, for his righteous work on our behalf. We thank you, O God, that you have carried out your mighty acts in your only begotten Son, and that you've given us a Savior, a Messiah, one who's saved us, to the uttermost from all of our sins. Help us, O God, to look to Jesus alone, to look to our Savior by faith. Through him, O God, pardon all of our sins. Accept us in Jesus. Account us as righteous in Jesus. And sanctify us in our glorious Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Our psalm of response is number 439 in the Trinity Hymnal.